It's my very special pleasure to welcome you all at the Munich Documentation Center for the History of National Socialism. A very special welcome goes to the conference participants of the German-American Provenance Research Exchange Program from museum professionals and to tonight's speakers and panelists, author Simon Goodman and museum professionals Hermann Patzinger, Richard Corin, Lynn Nichols, Nicholas, Gilbert Luper, and last but not least, to Carola Tieleke, who will chair the evening. The Munich Documentation Center has opened its doors only three years ago, in 2015. It had taken the capital of the National Socialist Movement no less than 70 years to come to terms with its past. This museum and center for education and learning is situated at the very spot of the former Brown House, the party's headquarters since 1930. Why had it taken so long? Why had Berlin become the capital of the praised German memorial culture since the millennium? The answer is easy. Where it concerns Berlin, the city was in dire need to justifications and symbols that made the new old capital of a reunited Germany look okay in international and in German eyes. Whereas Munich was somehow off the radar. Thanks to many initiatives, this building could be realized and was opened exactly in the moment of the 2015 refugee crisis, when the world looked at Germany with surprise and watched enthusiastic Germans opening their doors to exhausted refugees. Rod Kluger and other Holocaust survivors expressed their fascination with this new and different Germany. Things have changed since then, of course, and institutions like ours are facing new challenges with a party that demands the end of the German guilt. Here at the Documentation Center, we take these challenges as opportunities to reach out to various audiences by offering cultural and academic events from highbrow to lowbrow and a broad variety of exhibitions that include contemporary art, participative projects with schools and universities, and topics that connect the past with the present. I've taken up this job only half a year ago, and one of the first discussions I had with my team was about the nature of this institution. Are we a museum? No, we're not, not in a typical sense. We have no collection. And so far, exhibitions in this house have not included historical objects. That will change in the future. We understand ourselves as a center for education and learning, yet also a museum and a place for academic and cultural discourse. Therefore, I'm especially happy that you've crossed the street and given us the chance to host tonight's event. I deeply regret that my duties prevent me from participating in this conference, but I wish you all a most interesting discussion and a very successful event. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I would first of all like to welcome all of you here um, across the road from the ZE who have joined us since we walked across the road on behalf of the PrEP Steering Committee. And um, I would also, of course, like to welcome all of you back who were already with us for the afternoon. Um, we begin this evening with a panel on the topic of researching objects that belong to Jewish owners. We have two presentations um, from Megan Lewis, who's a research librarian and archivist at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and from Caroline Lange, who's um, a senior researcher for the Landesstelle für die Nichtstaatlichen Museen in Bayern. And we will have two responses to these short presentations from Laurie Stein and Sophie Lilly, who are both independent provenance researchers with a very long experience in um, consultative work for a whole host of different clients. So perhaps, Megan, would you just like to start? So first, I would like to thank the prep committee for having me talk tonight. I also want to say thank you to prep's funders for this opportunity, not only for myself, but for the other participants. Um, I'm going to talk today about the claimants. What do they say? Um, I don't come from an art museum background. I'm a librarian by training. And when I was learning about, the more I learned about Providence Research, I was realizing that we don't often hear from the claimants unless there's a legal battle, the survivors or other claimants, unless there's a legal battle or a lot of press or a book written about the case. So what do the survivors 
and other claimants say, and where do they say it? So, from my experience, there are three general types of sources where you can find information from the claimant's view. One is personal papers. Um, this is a screenshot of the Peter and Berta Victor papers. Um, there are two survivors who settled in Washington, D.C. Peter had fled Berlin with his parents and went to Shanghai. This is a screenshot from our online collections catalog. Uh, the Peter and Berta Victor papers are one of the 1,246 personal collections that the museum has scanned and are freely available on our website anywhere in the world. So, uh, and we're working on it. Um, that number is as of Monday, and it's a major project to scan as much as we can. Two, the second one is lawyer's files. These are more difficult because of confidentiality reasons. We only have a few collections um, at the museum. There are three major ones. Um, but from reading the personal papers and these lawyer files, it became clear to me that filing a claim was time consuming, expensive, and exhausting. And in some cases, the claim process just stops. Um, the claimant, the survivors or other claimants just stop answering the letters from their lawyers or from the claims agencies. Um, and you can sometimes see the frustration from the lawyers, like, I've written you four email letters about this. When are you going to respond? But I can understand just by reading the files why they are so frustrated. Um, the third major source is the restitution files. There are several organizations that were founded to help survivors with claims, uh, the United Restitution Organization, the URO, uh, was one of the largest. It had offices in many countries. The files contain, what's nice about these files is they contain the letters to the survivors, or, or at least the copies of the letters to the survivors, and the responses. So you're seeing both sides of the discussion. Unfortunately, URO records are scattered among multiple archives. Um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum has the Los Angeles office files and some of the Toronto office files. The remaining Toronto office files are in Montreal and the New York City, the New York office records are with the Center for Jewish History in Manhattan and I have not had a, the time to figure out where the Israeli office files are but I'm assuming Yad Vashem Central Archive for the History of Jewish People or somewhere like that. Sometimes a researcher gets lucky, and one person is in two different types of files. Um, these are from the Los Angeles uh, files. The left is, uh, it's a husband and wife. The left is their United Restitution Organization files. Um, the husband was from Poland, the wife was from Lithuania, so they had their own files. And the right is their lawyer's files. Um, they didn't make a jury claim, and they're one of the people who just stopped um, with the claim. They just stopped responding to, to letters. Um, but it's interesting reading the two different files. I'm sorry about this slide. There is some PowerPoint issue. Um, but the next section is what can you find in these types of files? What more details can you find? Um, and the first thing I'm going to talk about is inventories. The one on the left is from the Austrian claims application, and it is m many pages, multiple pages, of listing every type of personal property you can think of, down to differentiating between different types of ovens. It's like, did you have a coal oven? Did you have a gas oven? And it's just, you know, in, the survivor was supposed to check or list what they had. Um, it's very systematic and it's you know the same for every claim but it doesn't have a lot of space for more personal information or details and I find them kind of limiting because of that. On the right is Peter Victor. He very is very different. He went through room by room of his parents apartment describing not only describing the contents giving details about a lot of the, the t contents um, furniture, books, art, but he gives, so it's, and he tells you where it is, like this statue was on this desk. It's, it's really a fascinating read. What also I find interesting about 
this, his inventory, is that for some things, he gives very little information. You know, one of the things he says is three oil paintings of landscapes. He gives no artist information. He doesn't describe what the landscape looks like. However, he included enough information about his mother's Rosenthal China that I might be able to determine which specific pattern it is. Um, so I just found that interesting. He was 19 uh, when they left Berlin. Uh, this is uh, the next one. The next thing you can find is more specific details, especially when it's a more general claim. Um, this is a list of jewelry. It was specifically a jewelry claim against Austria. Um, and she goes through, you know, there's a ring with three diamonds, there's this brooch. And so you can see, you know, it's just not jewelry, it's this type of jewelry. And there's another document in this file, which is not quite as legible, that even goes into more detail. Um, this is the history of claims. This is actually not a collection at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. These are the papers of the famous Polish, French harpsichordist, Wanda Landowska. They're held at the Library of Congress. Um, the blue document is a copy of her first letter requesting the return of her property to French authorities. It's dated October 1940. Um, when she actually hadn't left France yet. She had fled Paris with two suitcases. The ERR came to her home in music school. The shipping list for everything they took back to Germany is pages and pages of just crates that they took. Um, when you take 14 harpsichords, you're going to have a lot of crates. Um, so 1940, she's in the south of France, and then um, she was able, since she was so famous, she was able to book a concert tour and got a visa to the United States that way. So she sends this letter in 1940. There are some documents that we have and the National Archives have about her time in exile. She ended up just staying in the US. The letter on the right is from Rose Vallant, who Provenance researchers all know from her work at the Jus de Palme. After the war, she worked for the French Restitution and Reparations Office, Wanda Landowska, um, and through her secretary, Denise Ristow, sent her a letter saying, do you know what happened to my property? And this is the response back. Um, and unfortunately, some of it was never found. Some of our instruments were too damaged. Her book collection and sheet music collection haven't been found. Part of her claim file in her personal papers is about her library. Um, after she died, her uh, Denise Rousteau, who was her secretary, her biographer, and one of her heirs, continued the claim. And it got so complicated of when the books and um, manuscripts and music, where it was and when. The uh, claims office interviewed Herbert Gerinkt, who had been the head of the Sonderstab music of the ERR. And unfortunately, to the best of his recollection, they were, the paper material was sent to a building in Leipzig, which was later bombed. So, oh, and the last document in the restitution file on Wanda, Wanda Landowska's papers is dated 1994. So that's 54 years of paperwork about restitution um, the other thing is, the last one is you can find out what other individuals and organizations were involved in a claim. Uh, some, a lot of the lawyer files include letters to lawyers in Germany or Austria who are like the people on the ground who are working on the claim. Uh, this gentleman here uh, worked a lot with one of the lawyers who we have their, his files of, um, but is not the only lawyer, German lawyer that the American lawyer worked with. And on the right, and this is hard to read, so it's the highlighted area. This is a Vienna uh, Austrian claim, and it says that someone, the Jewish community of Vienna acted as an intermediary for this claim and for the survivor. Um, and that gives you a new lead, especially with the IKG Wien. Um, their records are split between Vienna and Jerusalem, but the United States Holocaust Museum has copies of both collections, all 2.4 million pages of them, not all having to do with restitution. Um, but you are welcome to come to the museum and look at those uh, microfilm anytime you want. 
because sometimes you get a little surprise. The Library of Congress is probably not expecting not one, but two harpsichords with the, long, the papers of Wanda Landowska. So that's just interesting. This is their music reading room. I didn't know they were there until the archivist pointed out, hey, that, you're reading those papers. That's a harpsichord. Um, but on the left, this is Peter Victor again. So I had never looked at the photos that are part of his collection. And so I decided, because of this presentation, to do so. And in between the formal portraits and the vacation snapshots, I found this photo of his mother in their apartment. At least four, possibly five objects in this photo are listed in his inventory. It's the desk, the bronze statue on the desk. You can see, it's hard to see from a distance, but there, you can clearly see two of the landscapes, and there's that kind of horizontal, the perpendicular wall. And if you look at it closely, you can see yet another frame. So that might be the third oil painting he mentions in the claim, he mentions in his inventory. And I have to look at the original photo because there's a couple things in the background that I, if I could get a better look at with a magnifying glass, I might be able to figure out if they're also in the inventory. So one of the issues is where do you find all these papers? Um, an issue with Holocaust documentation is how scattered it is. Um, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum is trying to be as a repository with copies from as many archives as we have, but Wanda Landowska's restitution claims so far are in two archives in the United States, one in Germany, one archive, possibly two archives in France, and I recently sent an email to South Africa because uh, there's a possible lead there. So where can you find this information? One is museums like the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and research institutes. So if you're working with German Jews, the Leo Beck Institute in New York has a lot of personal papers. They have good finding aids for their personal papers, and they have scanned and posted online lots of their personal papers collections. Um, you have the European Holocaust Research Initiative Portal. Um, that's more focused on collections that include are about people as opposed to things, but it's still an excellent source because it pulls information from multiple archives all over the world, um, so all over Europe, the United States, and Israel. The second, the la archive grid is probably less known. It is a beta project of the OCLC, who runs the WorldCat. Um, International Library Catalog. It's been in beta for years, but there are up to a thousand different archives that are listed within it. And you can type the name of a person, a name of a place, and see what comes up. It has a lot of smaller institutions. It has a lot of small research institutions. It has a lot of university library um, collections. So if you're really looking for someone, it's worth the two minutes to put their name into Archive Grid. And genealogical websites, um, if they can help you find errors. Most of the geographic areas have special interest groups, which you can find through the main Jewish genealogical site, jewishgen.org. Basic membership in Jewish Gen is free. You just need to register. And from there, they have all different types of resources that can help you, like maybe help you find personal papers. Um, there's also a section on community websites, so you could reach out to the people running that website to see if they know anything about the person you're, and property you're researching. And of course, your favorite search engine. Um, you're gonna get a lot of false hits, but sometimes that's just what you need to do. Um, so in conclusion, Documents in personal papers, lawyers' files, and claims files show researchers which objects survivors felt important or more meaningful to them, their frustrations with the process, their feelings when they per do receive monetary relief, and the individuals and institutions they interacted with. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. About eight or nine years ago, I was a doctoral student. A friend of mine told me about a small lace doily that her grandmother had given her. It came with a story. Her grandmother said that her Jewish neighbor dropped it off on the evening before her deportation to a concentration camp. The grandmother had kept it, but as far as my friend knows, not used it. And then she too felt stuck with the object. Throwing it away seemed cruel, while using it seemed tasteless. 
When she asked her grandmother whether she really hadn't known anything about the neighbor's fate, she declined any knowledge, just like most Germans did after the war. Never seen, never heard anything specific about the Holocaust. Over the course of the years, I heard many stories like this one. Jewish neighbors or friends gave things away just hours before they were deported. And many recipients claimed that they never used those objects. This made me curious. Why didn't they use them if they, as they claimed, hadn't known anything about the Holocaust in the first place? During a workshop at the Leo Back Institute in London in 2007, Saul Friedlander told the story of a non-Jewish German family who acquired the bedding of a deported Jewish family and found themselves incapable of using it, but also couldn't throw it away. They were unable to use the bedding, however, and kept it locked away in a wardrobe. Now in the second generation, they had been able neither to use it, nor give it away, nor destroy it. This bedding was at the center of intense emotions which spanned and linked generations in the feeling of guilt, perhaps also of fear and sadness. After the autumn of 1941, the escalation of the Holocaust and public auctions of Jewish property went hand in hand. When the sales revenue was deposited on the legitimate owner's bank account, they sometimes weren't alive anymore, and the money and everything else was seized by the Reich. Sealed off apartments were opened and cleared out by the authorities, and complete inventories were sold within days or weeks after the deportations. Within months, new tenants had moved into the old homes. This means that after October 1941, buyers of Jewish household goods or renters of their homes benefited from the property of doomed individuals. Um, here's one. Uh, auction protocol uh, from the city of Würzburg, about two hours up from Munich. Um, it is, as you can see, quite a variety of things. We have uh, cakes, spatulas, we have several vases, we have uh, 29 doilies, and we have pillowcases, for example. How did people cope with their purchases? What did it mean to buy a cake spatula or a pillowcase during an auction, sometimes straight out of the apartment of the recently deported? Could the buyers easily and smoothly integrate the bedding into their own property? And could they sleep well in the bedroom? Did they try to forget, suppress, or deny the provenance? And what were their coping mechanisms? Also, if they did not succeed, were the new owners haunted or challenged by those objects? As you can imagine, this talk is also a very tiny meditation on available sources. How do we learn about those possible emotional obstacles because the official documentation ends right here with the protocols and the cash receipt. Of course, we do have detailed accounts, as we just heard, from surviving Jewish family members, mostly from post-war court files. But it is much more difficult to gather systematic evidence in order to reconstruct the emotional impact on the buying side. When the deportation started, Nazi authorities were very well aware of the greed of the non-Jewish German population. During a meeting at the Ministry of Finance, probably in November 1941, Josef Goebbels was quoted as saying that the Volksgenossen would lunch at the warm juice rolled like vultures. Um, in case you wonder, this is not a bad translation of mine. Uh, the expression doesn't make any sense in German either. <laughs> However, the vultures, he was right. People demanded access to the Jewish assets quite brazenly and directly. At first, the exploitation was meant to benefit authorities in particular. Looted furniture should be used to furbish public offices, field clinics, welfare institutions, and the like. A little later, however, authorities agreed that individuals who had lost their possessions during air raids should also profit. However, far more people claimed their share of the Jewish assets. They wrote to local finance offices, which were in charge of the exploitation of the left-behind property, um, or the supervising agencies, or they just showed up at the local branches, getting in the way of the officers who complained about this noisance. The mayor of Regensburg, for example, informed the chief finance president in Nuremberg about the, as he writes, extraordinarily lively demand for the approximately 43 Jewish homes that became available after, as he writes, evacuation. While it remains difficult to find archival evidence and to trace possible emotional obstacles which people faced after buying things taken from Jewish apartments, it is much easier to document the reactions of those who moved into those apartments. It seems as though both private individuals as well as public institutions were somewhat, let's call it, uncomfortable with the change situation. 
And while people had been untroubled by moving into the apartment of an emigrated individual just a couple of years earlier, they did indeed face, face emotional difficulties when they moved into the apartment of a deported person. Once the new tenants moved in, they felt some uneasiness in their new quarters. Many wrote letters to their local finances, their finance officers again and uniformly complained about the allegedly scruffy and soiled apartments which were completely worn as one is expected from the Jews, as they all put it, and hadn't been renovated for years, were disgusting, totally run down, and just completely unacceptable. Um, they all had visited the apartments before they moved in, by the way. Interestingly, they all asked for the same remedy. They wanted to whitewash the walls, and they asked the authorities for financial support, which was often granted. Their argumentation was fabricated. Not only had most of them visited the apartments before they moved in, sometimes we can even track earlier refurbishments. One apartment in Aschaffenburg had been thoroughly and costly renovated, including floors, paints, plumbing, and glazing in December of 1938, so just about three years earlier. Apparently, the duty of clearing the deserted apartments proved to be emotionally stressful as well. In the town of Neumark, the civil servants responsible for creating inventories of the Jewish assets after the deportation reported suffering from vertigo, respiratory distress, as well as nausea in the apartments. As so many others who felt uneasiness in the deserted homes, they blamed the allegedly utterly filthy and stuffy environment. They also explicitly complained about soiled clothing, indicating their discomfort with being touched um, by the deported individual's belongings. They asked for financial compensation so that they could buy new clothes. And it seems as if even the highest administrative ranks were somewhat uncomfortable and didn't know how to cope with the new situation. There is, for example, a rather surprising document from the Ministry of Finance issued on November 4th, 1941, uh, just a few weeks after the mass deportation started. Um, it is a confidential express letter which apparently went out to the Reich's chief finance president. It informed its recipients about the first deportations that had already taken place. And, and well, you can see it here. Uh, Berlin, Hamburg, Riesa, Ems, Region, Kassel, Cologne, and Dusseldorf. Um, and announced the leg, next large, sorry, <laughs> deportation around 1,000 individuals to take place in the city of Nuremberg. And then gave instructions on how to proceed with the expropriation and exploitation of the left behind property. And deserted apartments play a large role in this document. They should be given to people whose own apartments had been destroyed during air raids and who were left with nothing. However, before those homeless Volksgenossen could move into the apartments of recently deported people, the rooms had to be sanitized and renovated. Um, this is entwist und Stein gesetzt. The apartments were literally gassed. And indeed, quite a few protocols by local pest controllers and reports by public officers can be found in various state archives. The most impressive one is one from Aschaffenburg, which shows a rat on one side of the letterhead and an insect on the other. Um, and you, I spoke to one of our conservators this morning, and he pointed out that um, SO gas um, is a derivative of Cyclone B. So why did Jewish homes supposedly need disinfection in the first place? Also, what sense did it make to fumigate only one apartment, or sometimes even a few rooms in a building with several homes? A vermin infestation would spread throughout the whole building, through pipes and walls, which would have rendered partial treatment rather senseless and ineffective. There are only a few studies who mention this aspect at all, and some suggest that sanitizing was an official euphemism for suicides. However, all of the Jewish tenants of this protocol were alive when, when they were deported. While it cannot be ruled out that the expression might have been a euphemism in some cases, it was definitely not a standardized cover-up for suicide. Also, fumigation was not a usual procedure when one renter moved out and a new tenant moved in. It wasn't even a required procedure for treating infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, cholera, plague, or typhus. The emotional obstacle or the narrative of the filthy condition of the Jewish homes did apparently also not occur in 1938 or 1939 when immigration rates went up and apartments and houses also became available. After the fall of 1941, air rates were increasing and so was the need for intact homes. It was actually not the right time to become picky. 
people's and even authorities' reactions toward the Jewish apartments changed precisely in that moment when the deportation started. The research on the handling of looted everyday objects has only begun, and for the time being, there are many more questions than reliable answers. Was there an emotional relation between the time of the acquisition and their use or non-use? Troubling emotions, whether they be guilt, fear, bad conscience, grief, or a mixture thereof, were brought forward wrapped in official and ideological parlance as individuals would not have admitted to feeling any of these emotions, and maybe they weren't even completely aware of their nature themselves. This is why we find so many anti-Semitic stereotypes in these letters. They contain a mixture of the allegedly perennially wealthy but stingy Jew who didn't invest into his or her own housing, and the social parasite who lived in dirt and was a public health risk. The authors of these letters express moral outrage and argue that they could not reasonably be expected to live in those circumstances. However, this at the same time didn't keep people from acquiring even underwear and other most intimate personal objects. So what the new tenants apparently really wished for was a form of exorcism and cleansing. This is why whitewashing became such a veritable obsession. The more precarious the situation for the Jews became, the more intimate the auctioned objects became as well. Personal belongings such as bedding or everyday clothing were probably not routinely on sale before the 1940s. The tenants' rather violent reaction to something they had actively pursued becomes more understandable when we take into account that this last step of the looting and the implementation of the genocide were closely intertwined and went hand in hand. Moving into a formerly Jewish apartment after the fall in 1941 very likely simultaneously meant a death sentence for its rightful owner. While the acquisition of a Jewish business or precious metals and jewelry during the peak phase of the so-called Aryanization in the late 1930s could be argued away as a means to provide Jews with the required money to leave Germany, this argument vanished for good when it came to forced mass deportations. People must have been aware of this altered fate as their reaction, reactions changed noticeably. This suggests that the knowledge about the aim and the dimension of the deportations were known, perhaps not fully any detail, but enough in order to change people's attitude toward their acquisitions. Thank you very much. It's a little bit, it's a little bit alarming and jarring to hear these two, these two talks together. Um, it really shows you, I believe, very much the fact that on the one hand, what we try to do now is to re-individualize the victims of the Holocaust and locate some of the layering of history that has been lost because of their disappearance or their fates. Whereas at the same time, in the 19, at the same time that people were leaving and were being forced to leave and flee and being deported and killed, that at the same time there's a generalization of those same people and a loss of their individuality. So I think that this is very much an indication that in the work that we do and in the discourse that we have, we have to recapture that layering of history and we have to look very closely at all of the signals that it can send. So for example, in Megan's talk, as she really you know, sort of encouraged us to think about the different perspectives from which one could find information, we also have in Caroline's talk the same methodology, but with different resources. It's really pretty you know, mind-blowing to think that these two things are going on at the same time. And in the post-war period, you have the people who had suffered loss or individuals on their behalf or organizations on their behalf trying to find the information about them and the same people who had acquired these things, their heirs, trying to figure out how to deal with the burden of what they had inherited. Uh, it's, it's very, very moving. I think it tells us we always have to look at both sides of the story and all sides of the story. I'm glad Laurie went first um, because this was a, a, tough, um, a tough lecture to, um, to follow and I feel very emotional, yes. which I don't usually. Um, I'm also very grateful to um, Megan Lewis for including the voice of the claimants because 
as someone who has spent the last 20 years working for claimants. Um, now I'm here at PrEP on behalf of the Neue Gallery in New York, who I'm advising as a consultant. But really, my history is in working with private individuals who have um, claims um, for property that they are seeking. Um, Megan said something very much at the beginning, which I don't think everybody who comes from a museum, who works as a museum professional may be as aware of. You said that claims are time consuming, expensive, and exhausting. And I think you also said frustrating. And I would agree with all of those things because it's very important to understand that in this um, quest for um, recoveries, um, claimants and museums are unequal partners. These are usually not conversations between peers, but it's between an con institution that owns a property and someone who is trying to recover something who's on their own, who doesn't have the benefit of institutional support and whose time usually is running out as opposed to an institution that of course has um, a different a different luxury in terms of time and um, usually also money. Um, it was a, it was, the, we had two very jarring um, um, narratives really that we heard today, um, contradictory um, in many ways and I think that they are very important to show, you know, to really show those two sides. And, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my, <clears throat> um, my voice a little bit. Um, it's interesting because you began, Caroline Lange, by saying, by, by talking about the, the stories within families, that there were these objects that Jews gave away before their deportation, which is not the story I heard ever in my family or for many of the families that I've had the privilege of working with, um, they talked more about the vultures. So what it seems to me is that of course these objects, these relics that, you, that remained with German families only became problematic after 1945 when suddenly um, when, when, the, when the extent of, um, of um, the, um, the Holocaust really became apparent. And there were many ways of ensuring that the German population would be complicit in these crimes. And one of the very um, reasons and, and means of doing that was by, by linking the redistribution of Jewish property with things like social welfare, to buy at the Fugesta, um, which was charged with the, with the sale of Jewish movables. Um, there was preference that was given to newlyweds, to young soldiers, to people who had lost their home in an air raid. So of course, people had an absolute interest and, and became complicit. And, um, and I think it's very important for you to show the documents that you did. Um, I thought the, the, the connection, the, the terminology um, between having, you know, vermin and having an exterminator come to your house to make it livable um, was so poignant. And, um, and I think if anybody had any doubt about what we are doing, they should really remember those images. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Megan started by telling us a bit about the claimant's view from what she's been able to find in the archives. And I'm very happy today to be able to introduce to you Simon Goodman, who can give us the claimant's view in person. Um, Simon, after his father passed away, began researching the history of his family's collection. Simon is descended from Eugen Gutmann, one of the founders of the Dresdner Bank, and longtime patriarch of the Dresdner Bank. And um, after his father 
passed away, he came to the possession of papers which suddenly made him realize there was a whole new layer to his family history, and he will now give us an insight into his research in this matter. Okay. Thank you, Carola, for those the kind words. Uh, Christian Fulmeister, thank you. Jane Milosh, all at PrEP for inviting me here this evening. It's a, it's a great honor. Um, I feel a little out of my depths following all these accomplished academics. Uh, I'm just an amateur. I, I'm a claimant, I guess, who has a little bit of a knack for um, finding stolen art. Um, my story, this is what happened to just one family. Well, admittedly, we were before the Nazi era, quite a powerful, very rich, sophisticated, uh, great art collectors. And uh, so my, this one family story starts here with my great-grandfather, Eugen Gutmann. Here he is painted by Lenbach. I found this painting in Cologne by chance, and this hangs over my desk now. And. Uh, he was quite a brilliant young man. He revolutionized, really, German banking. Uh, he founded uh, branch banking, savings accounts. He, he took, uh, helped take Germany into the modern industrial era. Here's the Dresdner Bank uh, headquarters in Dresden in the 18, late 1860s. And from here, the fortune grew, and so did the art collection. It starts with little, beautiful things like this Neuber box, also from Dresden. There were bronzes like this Adrian de Vries, exotic Nautilus shells. Uh, my great-grandfather was deeply impressed by the, the green vault, the Grünes Gewölbe in Dresden. This one is fashioned by Nicolas de Graeber. He was from uh, Delft. And as I, I wrote a book called The Orpheus Clock, and as the, my title implies, there were lots of exotic clocks in the collection. This is an automaton. The ostrich flaps its wings every half an hour, and uh, the little bear beats his drum, too. Still works. And, well, all right, I'm jumping ahead here. The bank flourished until, as we all know, uh, things changed in the early 30s. Here you see the new headquarters in Berlin under new management. Um, the last director of the bank, from my family that is, is here, Herbert Gutmann. They've misspelt his name, but it's still him with a rather accentuated nose. You can see Jakob Goldschmidt, they've all got double the size in their noses. Uh, this is a Nazi party election poster warning the people about these Jewish manipulators behind the scenes. So Herbert lost his job. He was then forced to sell his estate, all his art collection in uh, a forced sale at uh, Paul Graupe in Berlin in 1936, just before Paul Graupe had to flee the country as well. Um, Herbert makes it to England, but he, he doesn't live much longer. <laughs> Meanwhile, this is his younger brother, Fritz, my great, my grandfather, excuse me. And here's my lovely grandmother. These are the grandparents I never met. You can see uh, photos taken by Man Ray in Paris in the 20s in happier times. My grandfather, Fritz, had the foresight it, it, uh, to move to Holland. In, uh, right after the First World War. He perhaps sensed what might be about to happen in Germany. Uh, he settled in peaceful Holland. And in this lovely 17th century house, a great art collection grew. There was already, he was the administrator of the Eugen Gutmann collection, and uh, he started in the 20s. He made his own fortune. He, he had, he was a, they were all very clever men. He, he found a way of circumventing the Versailles Treaty uh, banking restrictions on Germany. He acted as a conduit between the Dresdner Bank in Berlin and the North America, the rest of the world. Made his own fortune, and he spent most of it on, on beautiful paintings. But uh, he had a chance to leave in 1940. He thought he'd be all right. Uh, perhaps a little bit of arrogance, 
because the family had been so well connected. Even the Nazi Minister of Economic Affairs, Halmar Schacht, had worked for our family, so he thought, well, I'll be okay. Uh, I, I can wheedle my way out of this, perhaps. But here you see, on the left, he survives it's in 42. He's, he's the last Jew for hundreds of miles. And uh, even here, Heinrich Himmler has offered this assurance to the Italian ambassador, sorry, I'm jumping around here, who uh, interceded on our behalf. And Himmler is saying, they'll be safe as long as they stay in their house. So what does that mean? <laughs> they, they can't go very far. Uh, they were arrested in May 1943. They thought they were escaping to Italy where they'd been given a, a, a visa for uh, their connections with the Mussolini government even, you know. Uh, but the train took them to Berlin where my grandfather was asked one more time to sign over the, what was left of the family fortune. He refused. And my grandparents ended up in Theresienstadt. And immediately afterwards, oh, I'm sorry. Oh dear, very sorry. You see here, um, Goepel, one of uh, Hitler and Goering's agents, ordering the removal of the last artworks from the house. Uh, they, they didn't waste much time after the Gutmann couple had gone. And the house was full of beautiful things. These were items the monuments men recovered, were returned to Holland after the war, and then the Dutch government absorbed these into the Dutch national collection. My brother and I were able to find these in 2002, like this beautiful tapestry, and uh, we helped change <laughs> the laws there. I mean, it, it took some doing. You see, not, none of this is easy. We actually asked the help of the World Jewish Congress who helped us lobby uh, the Dutch government and uh, they were literally threatened. The state of New York said that they would uh, cut off all business with uh, the Republic of the Netherlands unless they uh, instituted a, a new restitution program. So. Uh, there was a vote in Parliament, they established what was called the Eckhart Committee, and the Eckhart Committee voted to, uh, first thing, to return about 235 objects to my family. It was a battle, but it was, it was a great victory. And I didn't stop after that. I mean, we, my wife and I had a very nice holiday, and then I went back to looking for what the Dutch had forgotten to give us back and what was still in, I don't know how many other countries. So on the left here, this is actually the same piece front and back, the silver Madonna I caught at uh, Christie's in New York. A German woman had consigned this. All she knew is that her grandfather had left it to her. And uh, Christie's, this is it sort of interesting, helped me negotiate a settlement. It wasn't perfect. There's a lot of compromise one has to do uh, involved in, in the restitution world. Unlike in Holland, where we were just given things back, that doesn't usually happen. Uh, we have to fight for what's ours, and I have to accept that in some cases, a current owner is an innocent owner. There's such a thing as a good faith purchaser, although I think that's an overused term. Um, on the right are two Weitstoss angels, which uh, I found in the St. Louis Museum. Again, I had to barter with them a little bit, um, but uh, a settlement was reached. And here, talking about the auction houses, in the early days, well, I, I found my first painting in Chicago in 95 and uh, changed my life, changed a few other people's lives too. A year later, uh, my brother and I discovered the Botticelli in Sotheby's in New York again. And uh, my brother flew to New York to try and stop the sale. Sotheby's retaliated by threatening him with a $2 million lawsuit, accusing him of uh, infringing on their right to do business. Well, 
I, I, I can't speak all night here, but you know, each one is a very complicated story. We did get out of that. None, none of us did go to jail or have to pay Sotheby's $2 million, which we didn't have. But uh, so we, we, we got a settlement just. And then several years later, I discovered uh, this Guardi, and it's a pair, there's a pendant too, that Sotheby's had sold to a collector in the north of England. This time, Sotheby's had kind of decided they wanted to cooperate with families like mine. And um, today, both Christie's and Sotheby's have vice presidents in charge of restitution, and they have departments that actually uh, do, do a lot of very serious research work, and mostly, I can call them and they help today. So in the last 20 or so years that I've been doing this, uh, things have changed dramatically. Um, ah, and here's an example of a, a nice museum I came across uh, in Stuttgart. I was fortunate enough to deal with a very experienced provenance researcher called Dr. Anja Hoyce who actually knew exactly what I was talking about when I wrote to her. And it didn't take long for everybody to agree that this beautiful clock, which I named my book The Orpheus Clock After, uh, had been looted from my family and the state of Baden-Württemberg should return it. So this is particularly significant. Uh, apart from some compensation my father got for his, his mother's fur coats, um, and we got 50% of the 1940 high values on four paintings that had disappeared in Germany, one of which had been lost in uh, the move from Karin Hall Goering's collection to Berchtesgaden. Garden. It was a small Renaissance portrait, and we assumed that some German soldier cut it out of its frame and rolled it under his coat. And it's gone, so my father was given a pittance for that. But otherwise, this is the first direct restitution my family received from Germany. So as you see, 2011. And here I am with my latest sort of <laughs> escapade. This is a Kranach from the family collection. There were three Kranachs at one point. Uh, this is a very strange story. I don't know all the ins and outs of it yet. I can't quite believe what happened, but a, an antique dealer, I mean, he was more a bric-a-brac dealer in Arkansas, um, called Christie's after his wife had rented, borrowed my book from their local library, and they deduced that this was one of the paintings they just bought literally in a car park outside Chicago. Uh, they, they, had, they bought 15 paintings, 14 of them were rubbish, and one of them was this Kanach Prince. And uh, this man realized he was sitting on gold, and so he called Christie saying, I think I've, we've read this book. And Anyway, a, a very strange settlement had to be settled. Uh, this man was talking about divine intervention, but I think he was more interested in a huge finder's fee. And here I am in New York anyway at the uh, restorers putting our prints back in order. Um, meanwhile, here's uh, one of the few remaining photos of the house uh, Bosbeck in Hemstede in Holland. Um, Sadly, most of our letters, our family documents, photos, all, all went, or probably went up in smoke when war broke out. Uh, most of what I do today is based on inventories I found at the American National Archives. You know, now there's a wonderful website called Fold3. I found a lot in the Dutch National Archives in The Hague. The French Foreign Ministry gave me and my brother about 10 telephone directories worth of documents on my family, including all sorts of letters from Rose Vallon. Uh, here, Richard Winkler, the Bavarian uh, State Archives has been extremely helpful. I, I spent a week in Koblenz. Uh, you know, I, I <laughs> it's hard work, but I find it exciting. So anyway, what I'm saying here is, well, this piece got ripped out of the wall and is now in a museum in Northern Holland in Drenthe. 
I filed a claim, it lasted about three years, and I got turned down for it. I thought we had a pretty obvious provenance here of where it came from. Um, you know, there's a big hole in the wall to this day, but uh, on a technicality, the Dutch government turned me down. But I'm, I'm moving along here. You see the, this room and all the other rooms were full of beautiful Ming uh, vases and a lot of Meissen. We, we came from Dresden. And it's kind of uh, more what I'm focused on these days. In the last 20 or so years, I've recovered uh, with my brother probably over 20 paintings or we've received settlements for them. And there are a few. There's another Dugar that's still missing. There's a Van Ostade. I'm in a negotiation for a Van de Capella, but mm, there's a beautiful Cassoni panel by Biagio D'Antonio I would love to find, but mostly we've settled, we've figured out what happened to most of the paintings. But the vases, well, the antiques, even though we got nearly 200 back from the Dutch government, um, there's still hundreds, hundreds out there. And what I do is a point of honor. Uh, I have in my house a little shaving stand that came from my grandfather's bedroom, and I found it in the basement of the Rijksmuseum. And uh, from one German inventory during the war, it was used as a flower pot holder until it was uh, turned over to the Munich collecting point. And now it's in my house. I, I have a lot of Meissen that's broken, that's been very carefully glued back together. So these small things matter. And so this was one of the first big inventories of the house. There are probably about three big inventories of the house and a couple of minor ones, in all probably totaling about 2,000 pieces. So even though we've recovered hundreds, and before me, my father and my aunt recovered also hundreds, um, it, it's an endless pursuit. But uh, you know, and now, unfortunately, I'm 70, but uh, I think I've got a few more years left in me, so I'm still at it. Uh, here you see, uh, this is number 27 on this inventory. Here's 27. So there are actually 20 of these four-cornered vases made in Meissen. And, sorry, I've lost my line. Uh, somewhere it should say that four of them went to Haberstock, Karl Haberstock, who was one of uh, the main... German dealers who, who emptied out my, my grandparents' home. Um, after Karl Haberstock died, uh, Frau Haberstock donated uh, a lot of Meissen to a museum in Augsburg, including these two vases. Uh, what, what's interesting is that the museum in Augsburg is prepared to give these two back to me, but not the other 30 pieces I'm claiming, such as these two little bowls even though, you see here, I mean, we talk about multiple sometimes, uh, and Meissen, well, it's not quite that. Uh, these have what are called Johanneum numbers. This is when the King of Saxony sold them, uh, when the, they'd lost their constitutional role as a monarch, and uh, they were probably actually short of money. So you see here, number 79, Zwei Meissner, Schaller, Blau. Well, sorry, my photos ended up being green, but I mean, they were blue. <laughs> Maybe Frau Habershot repainted them. Um, I called the museum because it, it's odd. I, I've got say, this particular inventory that this was from, where it's number 79. I have about now nine versions of this inventory, and every one is slightly different. And just one of them mentions the Johanneum numbers, the others just say mice and bowls or something. And so I called the, the museum in Augsburg and said, what's written, painted on the under, underside of your bowls? And they said, oh, 49Z. Well, I said, okay, can I have those back as well, please? And they, oof. Um, so they're thinking about it still. And I'm gonna have to argue, obviously, each line, line by line, um, it, it, it's one of those things I had hoped that after all these years, claimants who had most clearly, obviously, been robbed blind would, would be given the benefit of the doubt. We can't have all the documentation that we need in certain cases because 
uh, in, in many instances, the people taking our belongings also burnt our documentation uh, and destroyed our family papers. So uh, I think I've made a fairly good case here, but uh, I, I have to argue point for point. I, I have a small silver cup in the Met that I've claimed, and uh, I've proved beyond doubt that it's the same one in my great-grandfather's collection. We have the, uh, in my great-grandfather's inventory, it says that the, the silversmith's mark at the bottom is C, large T, and then a small M. And so I asked the Met what, again, on the underside, and they said it was CTM. I said, well, okay, what else do you need to know? So instead, they, they, they've sent uh, their own researcher to Holland to get their own versions of all the documents I gave them two years ago. Uh, here's another museum claim. Sometimes I'm lucky, sometimes I'm not so lucky. These two lovely Maiolica dishes, certainly not multiples, are painted by the master Zanto Aveli, and I found these in the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam. So our things are kind of all over the place. Um, it seems like, but they, at least they end up in good museums, which makes it slightly easier for me to trace. And here's an example, this one, this is from our family catalog, the number, and there it is today in Rotterdam. So the, the Dutch Restitution Committee are acting as a, an arbitration board in this instance, because it's, uh, the Boymans Museum is an independent museum. In my experience, uh, public museums, state museums that have a, a political or social purpose, why they're there, tend to receive families, claimants like mine, uh, more openly in a slightly more generous way, whereas private, the more private a museum is, the harder it becomes usually. And uh, unfortunately, the same goes for most art galleries. I haven't had much success getting galleries to divulge information about who bought something, who sold something, but I'm not giving up. And uh, this is one example. This is the final inventory of my grandparents' home. This is what was taken out of the home after they'd been arrested. And as you see, this is page eight. Many of these are multiples. You've got six here, five small old, or is this old oriental carpets. Uh, this goes on to page 12, uh, in some cases uh, many multiples. So this one inventory could amount to 500 pieces alone. And from what I can deduce, none of these were ever turned over to the Munich collecting points. I, I must say, I'm in sort of awe being here. Um, <laughs> I, I've spent so many hours going through the German Historical Society website, looking at all the cards and all the inventories of the Linz Museum. It's, it's sort of extraordinary. It's quite an honor, you know, as I say, to, to actually be here uh, where, where it all happened. Um, so this is an example of after my father and his sister spent 30 years after the war trying to get things back and I've now spent nearly 25 years, there's still hundreds of pieces left. You know, it's one thing to find a Botticelli, but finding a little Louis XV's chair that might not even be really be Louis XV or who, who, who knows. Um, so it, it's an indication of, I think, how much is still out there. Uh, the the Terzin, conference, they talked about 100,000. Well, I, I think that's a, a gross underestimate uh, of, of what's still missing. Uh, here's a little example of some of the things I'm working on. This is a sculpture. He's called a prophet by Jörg Sierlin, um, although I think it looks like Tillman Riemann Schneider. But, uh, this is last seen in Paris in my grandfather. My grandfather also had a large storage facility in France. He thought the Maginot line would hold, so he was hiding things sort of all over the place. That didn't work. Um, this obviously disappeared in Paris, 1940, no trace since. This is actually recovered after the war, this Spanish shield. Uh, Karl Haberstock had it in the Aschbach Castle, and it was turned over to 
same castle that Gorlit was hiding in. Uh, this was turned over to the, uh, not the Munich collecting point, uh, Wiesbaden, and uh, then uh, they need, I think one of our shields, there were several, they, they returned to Vienna. This is one of the Provenance problems. There's uh, very distant cousins of ours, uh, a collector called Rudolf von Gutzmann, and so they were saying, which Gutzmann is this? Um, usually it, it's the monuments men got it right almost you know, 99% of the time, which is kind of remarkable. But then, sadly, they were disbanded and didn't have time to actually return things to the right people. So this is it. From Wiesbaden, it might have gone back to Holland, but the Dutch have no trace of it. So that's 1945, last seen. This is last seen, this lovely silver uh, little casket in... Rotterdam in 1955 on loan to the Boymans Museum again, but now they say they don't know where it's gone. More, here we go. Uh, this is one of these sort of problems for me. I know we owned it in 1938, the Antico sculpture, but I can't prove exactly where or when we lost it. And so claimants like mine are at a disadvantage. It, it was ours. I don't know where it's gone, I'm still looking. Here's one of the lovely cups. I suspect Hermann Goering got this, but we got some of the silver that went to Goering back, but this has never been seen since 1940, as far as I know. And this is an interesting story. I'll sort of end here. Uh, this Veronese actually came from the Alta Pinacothek here in Munich. Um, I, the story goes that the museum director, Buchner, was told by Hitler himself that there were too many Flemish, Italian, French, whatever, non-German paintings in his museum and he had to kind of rectify that quickly and they didn't have any money in those days. So a strange swap exchange was arranged with a few collectors. There's one instance where a, a beautiful Raphael gets exchanged for some not very good paintings. And in our case, my grandfather gave the Alta Pinacothek, two old German early Renaissance masters. Um, they're both there still to this day. Uh, one is by the Meister of the Mornauer Bildnisses. Uh, I think it's the first Habsburg Archduke. And in return, my grandfather got three paintings of Rubens, a Herit Dau, and this Veronese. The, the Rubens and the Herit Dau, an unscrupulous, I like, dare I say this, art dealer in Paris who was supposed to be representing my grandfather's best interests, sold these paintings quickly before France was invaded. The Rubens went, to, it's now in the Courtauld Institute in London in Somerset House, and the Herr Dow is uh, back in the Boymans Museum again. Uh, yeah. um, and, and what happened to the money? They did pay for these paintings. So the problem is my, my, my grandfather never got the money. But the Veronese is on an ERR list. It's one of the first. It disappears. It's confiscated from our storage. I thought I'd found it in, in uh, America, actually. Sotheby's again. But they were selling a, a, a copy. And I could tell the, the Madonna's cape was all wrong and the fastener was quite different. So. This is where I sort of end my story. It actually, you know, is endless, but uh, it gives you an example of how much is still out there, and, and you get an idea of why I, I can't stop looking, uh, and, and the difficulties involved. You know, thank God today, you know, where I live, I live in Los Angeles, by the way, and uh, a couple of miles from the Getty, from the GRI, which is my favorite place. I'm like a, you know, kid in the candy store, going through their photo files and. Now I've had the honor of going through the ZI uh, Burla photo files downstairs, and uh, I can't wait to get back tomorrow to see what I can find. So <laughs> thank you for listening to my tale. Um, that's what the book's like. Uh, interestingly, I can't find a German publisher. It's, 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 come out in 12 countries now, but not Germany. What can I say? Okay, thank you very much, Simon, for your talk. I'm sure that it was pretty difficult to keep it that short, because I'm sure you have very many other stories that you could tell us, which would be very interesting, and um, 
perhaps a sequel to the Orpheus clock at some point is indicated. <laughs> yes. Um, I would now like to ask uh, some further panelists to join me up here on the stage. First of all, Hermann Patzinger, the president of um, Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz. Um, Gilbert Lupfer, um, who has uh, a double function and is here, is both for, from the Staatliche Kunstsammlung in Dresden and is also the um, Wissenschaftlicher Vorstand, that in English is the executive board of the Deutsches Zentrum Kulturgutverluste. Um, then Richard Curran, who's a Smithsonian Distinguished Scholar and Ambassador at Large um, for, from the Smithsonian Institution, and Sophie Lilly, who we've already met. So, <clears throat> um, is this angeschaltet? Yeah. Um, as you may have noted, the um, title of this evening, the, the kind of overarching title, is um, Restitution, uh, Provenance Re Research and Restitution Managing Collections and Public Expectations. So for this discussion, I would like to broaden the perspective a little bit and um, talk about various public expectations and how museums can perhaps meet these public expectations and if not then possibly manage them by explaining to the public why um, it, in some cases it's not possible to perhaps balance all the different expectations we have and to balance other limitations that we have as museums. And um, to kickstart the conversation, I'd like to ask each of the panelists one question, and also please, each of you feel free to react directly to Simon's presentation, perhaps, if you have any direct remarks. Um, I'd like to start by asking Professor Partzinger um, how the work of the SBK in the area of provenance research has evolved since 19... 98, when the Washington Principles were passed, and how this um, this evol uh, evolution of the work in provenance research has changed your interactions with heirs of former owners, with claimants, with the um, the people who approach you about pieces in the collection. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank you for this really impressive lecture. I think many of us which have to, which are dealing with these complex problems, can add a few other examples which we heard or which we um, experienced. Um, it shows um, that it's a diff very difficult issue. And uh, talking about this, I mean, I'm now for 10 years in charge of the foundation. Um, the uh, Washington Principal have now 20 years. Um, I think we should start to, to look back until the early 90s because what is really even looking back uh, um, surprising for me and I think for all of us is after the compensation talks in the 1950s and 60s, uh, of course it was basically real estate and other fortunes and so on. There have been other things more important than, than artworks. This problem, or we have not been aware, there is still a problem to deal with. And it was only after the German unification with the collections from the East, which came in the East, there was never done compensation and so on, from East Germany, I mean, but also in the West, in the Western collection, there was still a lot to do. But it was unbelievable how that it needed still eight years until the Washington principles to get aware that is something which is a huge problem and we have the responsibility, especially we Germans, but everywhere who holds such kind of, of objects, but especially we Germans have the responsibility to deal with it and to respond to it. And um, <clears throat> what, what then happened is, I mean, it took another 10 years until what is now the DZK in Magdeburg, there was the... Uh, a working group for provenance research which was founded in 2007-2008 and adapted to the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation uh, led by, by Mr. Hartmann in, in Berlin. And it took really a lot of time. And what was 
also, but there's a difference now when I see what is happening now and when I look back to what was 10 years ago and even further, um, at that time, uh, public institutions reacted and acted when claimants showed up and asked for certain things. Then it was clear that the museums have to prove that they, 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 they got it uh, legally or not. And then if not, then to restitute. But what we now are doing in the last years more and more is really not only when claimants approach us, but also do systematic research on everything which was acquired between 1933 and which was after 1933, because it was a post-war period, we have to trace back all the ways how the, the work of art have been acquired. Um, so doing systematic research on the collections, with third-party funding, and, on, and then what we do more and more, approach from our side, when we have certain results, approach uh, heirs or former owners. So this, this is a real, it, what I want to say, it took a lot of time until we, got, we all got aware that there is something to do. Then it started step by step, and now we reach a phase where really systematic provenance research, even there is a lot of things to do. We, we talked in the afternoon about uh, paperworks and all this, uh, this mass, uh, mass uh, uh, complexes, which is really difficult to identify. But um, it's, it's really now the time to continue this systematic provenance research. But it also takes time. I think this is something, I mean, it is clear, it took so much time, there is a certain impatience, which is understandable, but I mean, one also has to understand that, that we have really to, to reconstruct how the way of the acquisition has been, because of course we are responsible for the collection, we cannot just restitute, but if it is clear that the acquisition was illegally, I mean, there is no, no point to, to, to restitute these objects. I mean, it's still a difference, but I will stop now between public institutions and private owners. Mm -hmm. Because we have for us, for us all of us, is the, the property, the Washington principles um, are the guidelines, but of course we do not have a restitution law, and for private owners, it depends what they want to do. But many things one can add, but I stop. Sophie, you already mentioned in your response the frustrations that um, claimants that the victims' families can experience. And I think this is something that came out pretty clearly in Simon's presentation, that it can be a frustrating progress, uh, process. And uh, looking further back into the files, Megan Lewis also found that many of the papers she, she, she finds in her files also bring this frustration to the causes. Um, I'd like to ask you what your um, experiences working with public institutions have been. Have you, have, do you have the feeling that there's been a change over the last years, that attitudes have changed? Um, do you have best practice examples where you've worked particularly well with public institutions? I'm coming from a slightly, I'm sorry I'm losing my voice <laughs> as the evening progresses. I'm coming from a slightly different situation because, of course, um, I work primarily on formerly Austrian collections, and so I'm dealing more often in an Austrian um, context. And, of course, the situation there is quite different in that there is an art restitution law, and it is also celebrating its 20th anniversary, and that, of course, has changed a great deal. When I started out, and for 20 years ago, or plus, um, the situation was very, very different. The cases were probably easier, you know, because things were more clear-cut. What, what we're still seeing now is that the cases, the particular, you know, um, um, claims that we deal with have become more difficult, more complex, less, um, less clear-cut. But our means of documenting particular, you know, um, um, claims has, and the means of research have become quite, quite different and far more sophisticated. So as a provenance researcher, uh, you know, um, the situation has really changed. When I started out 20 years ago, um, not only did you, I think Lynn was laughing about um, how we would line up for copying, photocopying privileges, but um, in, 19, in the 1990s in Austria, you, if you got to see, there was a difference between seeing a document and being allowed to copy it. 
um, and quite often there was a there was a uh, prohibition of copying. So, and if you you know sort of fast forward to 2018, we have things like online resources, we have online catalogs, we have the German sales um, index. So those are things that are very very different in terms of the communication. Of course, it has changed. Um, um, I think um, in in Austria certainly it has changed. I think one of the big, um, big, um, probably the, the the biggest recovery was also the one that brought the biggest change with the restitution of um, Gustav Klimt's Adele Blochbauer. For in for many reasons, if only that it brought the case of restitution home to everybody. It, this was a painting that everybody knew, but they also got over it. They understood that if that restitution was not something to be merely afraid of, that it could actually bring a positive, a positive reaction. You could get positive press and paintings can go back um, and be returned, and the world will continue turning, and you can still go see Adele Blochbauer just on another continent. But I think those are things that have really uh, brought a change, apart from the fact that, of course, it's also a different generation doing this. Um, and probably, you know, all of the young researchers in this room, um, in their institutions, are doing a lot to change the climate that we deal with and the, the, the conversations that we have and the communication we have. Richard Curran, um, I'd ask, like to ask you about some of the other public expectations you've experienced. Obviously the, the group, the, the victims of the Holocaust and the, their families, they are, when we're talking about this, this issue, they are of course the most important part of the public we have to think about. But at the same time, museums cater to the entire public and they have to sometimes try to do a kind of balancing act. And I would like to hear a little bit from you about your um, experiences. For example, I, I know that in America, donors play a great role. And has this whole debate somehow affected how you, for example, interact with your donors? Well, you know, you have people like Simon who are a pain in the neck. <laughs> and, and, and that's actually healthy and that's been healthy and good for the museum world because it, it kind of forces the action. And it, we, somehow we have to get from, you know, the pain in the neck or other parts of the anatomy <laughs> to what Armand is talking about, which is with regard to, you know, really systematically looking at this as a problem. And we're somewhere in between there. So the resources aren't there. I don't think the resources are there. I don't think the legal structure is there. The access isn't there. We're not fully there in terms of accessibility of records and so on. So we're not there quite in terms of the systematic uh, level. And quite frankly, there's a lot of museums that just want those pains in the asses to die off and go away, and then they'll be scot-free. So, you know, we're somewhere in between. But I think what Simon said in, in the course of your, uh, uh, you know, really exposition of your own adventure and experience in this, is that I think there are changes, of course, as I've seen in American museums. Now, sometimes they're good and sometimes they retract a bit. <laughs> so it's healthy to see some of the collectors like Sotheby's and Christie's, for example, come around. At first, they, at first they have to be forced into something, but you know, you make a moral argument, and I think the public is attuned to those moral arguments. There have been you know, a number of cases, certainly in Europe, there's an issue of justice. As I was uh, talking earlier today, uh, American museums really had to come to grips uh, with their own situation, which was the acquisition of American Indian returns and restitution, and that's been huge. I, I gave the figure earlier today, but Smithsonian has given back 260,000 items, 260,000 items to Native tribes, and so I think we're past the hump of, well, one, there was a law, but two, along with it, a kind of moral and professional responsibility to invest in research and do it. And if a museum today would hold out and say, hey, we have this tribal treasure, we have the bones of your ancestor and we're refusing to give it up, I think there would be an onslaught of public opinion 
you know, to, 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 to force the issue. That said, we're still fighting this in some cases. And I, I think your perception is right. I think in America, the public museums are probably better than the private, private museums and then private collectors. Uh, we faced a very tough issue earlier this year where actually the, a director, a former director of a major museum, did an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal basically saying that it was all right for collectors and museums to acquire looted objects from ISIS. That was actually made in the Wall Street Journal. And the, the frightening thing is that I, I actually had to threaten museum directors <laughs> that I would do an op-ed piece about museums as culture vultures unless that, that statement was retracted or the American, uh, the American Association of Museums was, was opposed to that. But the art museum directors, my guess is it would have been a 50-50 vote <laughs> whether it was okay or not to do that, which is amazing because that money is going was going directly to terrorism. It was obviously stolen and going directly to terrorism. And yet the argument was made, well, if we don't buy this, it'll disappear, so we better buy it to preserve it for the future. So sometimes you're disappointed. After that editorial came out, by the way, the FBI put out a notice. And they said, if you do this, you're abetting terrorism. <laughs> I think that got people's attention. But uh, what I found in that is that I think museum directors, collectors, donors in many cases, were not really looking, they weren't looking to support ISIS, they weren't looking to support terrorism, they just wanted a cheap deal. <laughs> they just wanted, they wanted to get those Roman coins out of Syria and if they can get them for a hundred bucks a piece instead of not being able to get them at all, they wanted them. And so, it, it, you know, it's sad because there's still, as I think we saw in the, uh, in the, the earlier presentation on the, um, the taking over of Jewish apartments and homes. You know, there's no lack of people that, you know, want their cake and they want to eat it too. And that continues. So even though we think the moral arc has, has gone our way in terms of doing what's right and just in these cases, we're always surprised by sometimes our, our colleagues. <laughs> Gilbert Lupfer, my question to you would be, um, as board of the DZK, you um, help to manage the German government's assistance, financial assistance for research, in, for provenance research in Germany. And um, I would like to know how the development in the scene has changed the, the way that you perhaps finance this research, the way that you look at projects when they're suggested to you um, for funding? I think I have to t tell some different points. Uh, the first is now we look with our funding, with our support for provenance research uh, by the Deutsches Zentrum Kulturgut Verluste to reach different types of museums. Very often we, we talk about paintings. When, when, I, when I came to this uh, field in not 20 years ago, but 15 years ago, we were only talking about paintings, about painting galleries. In the last years, this uh, area widened, opened. We, we talk about, uh, about ceramics, we talk about prints and so on, but there are still a lot of museums, types of museums, who just start, some start to, uh, to begin with provenance research. Let's talk about technical museums also. On. Let's talk about ethnological museums, but not under this aspect you, Richard, uh, mentioned, uh, under this uh, post-colonial aspect, but I think some or a lot of ethnological museums, anthropological museums also have objects who came from Jewish owners. It's very difficult to talk with anthropological museums about this way. We have a, a quite different uh, point of, of view. Then, in the 
early 2000s, we, we talked a lot of, of great museums, great galleries. Now we, we try to uh, come to small museums, small museums in, the, in, 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 in small cities, small communal museums with very uh, with a very small pro, uh, professional staff with no on nearly no money we la we address directly these small museums and help them to look in their in their inventories whether there are uh, looted art the, f the third point is the third aspect are private coll collectors i think that's very difficult since one and a half year about, we from the Deutsches Zentrum Kulturgutverluste are able to support private collectors to make research in their collections. And I think we are, we, we only made the first step. It's, it's a very, very uh, long way to convince private collectors that they can't be happy with their collection if there is if they don't they don't know where it the, the objects come from we are have this this uh, program for private collectors uh, since I, I said one and a half year about and it's only uh, it's not a, a handful of private collectors who are in, uh, who accepted this they have uh, we, we have to accept the Washington principles. If they get uh, funding from us, they have to agree that they uh, publish objects in, in question in, in the lost art database. And that's a great, a very great hint for private collectors. I think uh, we had a, a when we started with, with this in 2017, we thought, oh yeah, it, it will be a little bit difficult, but that it's so difficult to convince private collectors to look for, their, for the origin, or origins of their collections, we didn't think. It's, I think it will last still a lot of years to convince a, a greater number of private collectors. On the other hand, with our, uh, with our funding, for private collectors, we had we got an uh, got an, an in an other other way we we are uh, quite successful. But we didn't first we didn't think uh, for this. But now we help to reconstruct private collections, uh, stolen Jewish private collections, and where we got uh, a lot of interest for this. But where is uh, that's, I think that's, that's will, in the next years will be more and more important to reconstruct, uh, spread stolen collections. But on the other hand, uh, I, I, I only can say to everybody, help us to convince private coll collectors in Germany or whatever to look into their collections. We can give them funding, we can give them prof professional uh, help, but they must agree, they must accept for, for themselves the Washington principles, the Lost Art database, and nobody just can force them to do this. Um, is there any kind of reactions from any of you to the statements that others made? Yeah. I mean, what, just what you said concerning the private collectors, I mean, it's clear for public institutions, the Washington principles, which are always called a soft law, is a very sharp law because no public institute, institution, museum, library, whatever, archive, could really dare to not restitute an object which is clear that it was illegally acquired. So for our side, that's fine. I don't know what, what the discussion in the future will bring. If you learn about more, uh, um, loot, let, let's say, illegally acquired looted objects uh, in private collections, if there is not, I mean, there's a, there's a long discussion ongoing, the, the pro and the contra about the restitution law. I mean, this would be a different issue then for private collections. I, I repeat, we don't need it, but I mean, for private collections, it would be a different situation. I mean, this perhaps we should, I don't know what, 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 you, what you mean. And another comment, what, what Richard said, 
which now we are in the afternoon, we talked about provenance research antiquities, the colonial issue is at least twice a week, there are articles in any newspapers in Germany and so on, we discovered the colonialism and so on and so on, which is fine. And what you said, it is clear the, the parallels between what the, the so-called Islamic State is doing and the Nazis is really surprising. On the one hand, for ideological reasons, destroying art, because they consider it... Uh, it has to be destroyed because it's un-Islamic, as the Nazis, for other reasons, destroyed so-called degenerated art, etc., etc. And at the same time, using this kind of art for making money. I mean, these are two exact parallels. But nevertheless, nevertheless, I mean, especially being a German, I think these are new fields of provenance research, which are very important. And public awareness is very important. What you said, not to say, well, I will buy this sculpture uh, from Syria because then it is in good hand. I mean, it's not the way of acting, and this is awareness raising. But nevertheless, I mean, we still have a lot to do on the so-called talk of so-called Nazi looted art, and this must be really um, first priority, I think, because there it is really something to. We have this 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 legacy, this this heavy legacy on our shoulders, and this responsibility, and we and this kind of research we are doing to identify objects to give back. What we are doing with archaeological collections, with colonial col ethnological collections, better said, this is more what we talked in the afternoon, the the biography of objects. There may be included restitutions. But I mean, this is a, a different perspective, and we should not forget that we still have a lot to do concerning this this this, this Holocaust issue. I add a little word there. Um, I want to commend all the participants for the, their contributions. I just want to put a personal perspective on this. I, I, I still can't get over the fact that what we're doing today, which is commendable, didn't happen 50 years ago. Um, back then when it should have happened, it was a dead issue. So we're a generation later, I suppose that's part of the reason why. But um, I mean, there are other issues too. I, I think, you know, that you can split museums and collectors into two camps. Those who consider all of this that we've been talking about a legal problem and those who consider it a moral problem. And until we realize it's a moral problem and that you need to make what we call in the States a certain amount of affirmative action, uh, this is going to be an ongoing problem. It will never get, it will never come to an end, you know, uh, until <laughs> some extraordinary measures are taken to finish this. Uh, you know, it, it's amazing that here we are. We're going to be 100 years uh, after the end of the war before we know it, and there's still going to be a lot out there. So that's just my personal take on it. Your search for your family's collection has been a truly global endeavor. And um, since we are a program, a, a German-American exchange program, I'd be interested to hear from you what the differences you've, uh, you've noted working in the different countries. And perhaps then the other panelists can respond to that a little bit. And perhaps the other thing, Hermann Patzinger mentioned the question of do we need a different legal framework? Would you have found a different legal framework helpful? In America, of course, there's a lot of litigation that you had to go through. In Europe, sometimes things are organized differently. What's your take on that? And perhaps what do the other panelists think? Well, yes, the laws in the US are easier or more convenient to use for a claimant, uh, which is why some cases of even that are German cases have shipped, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, have moved over to the US because that's the only place they can still be heard in court. Uh, however, the whole legal process, when it is available, is extremely expensive and, and really only works in the case of if you're claiming a hundred million Gustav Klimt. Otherwise, when I'm back down to little mice and bowls, it has to be an individual who knocks on a door and says, excuse me, I, I think. So in, in that respect, um, they're good and people in every country. Uh, I've, I've had success with the French government, less actually with the British government, I'm ashamed to say. Um, the Dutch government showed enormous willingness from uh, 2000 or 99 onwards, but it almost looks like 
they're losing patience. They're, they're, there's a sort of a, a, a reactionary movement who, who would like this whole restitution business to come to an end. Uh, a lot of people are asking, how long does this go on for? Well, as I said, because if this had started in 1950 instead of 1995, uh, it might have come to an end by now. But otherwise, my, my experience is a sort of they're equal in each country. Uh, they're, they're, I, I've come as I came across, as I said, a great museum in, in Stuttgart. I came across a great museum in New Jersey. Uh, and then I have uh, not such good experiences with a different museum in the US and a different museum in, in Holland. So uh, as I said, it's down to the, the, the willingness of the possessors to reach uh, a, a moral solution because otherwise if you stick to the letter of the law even when the law slightly favors us in saying the state of new york it's still prohibitive from a financial point of view i think in fairness we also have to say that of course the narrative is a very different one and that's a huge difference between are you dealing with an austrian or german museum or are you dealing with an American museum? In Austria and Germany, those institutions will have been intimately involved in the process of dispossession. So they're dealing not only with, you know, a claim on a particular piece, but that they're, they're dealing with the history of their institutions. And they may not, it may not be their fault, this is not about blame, but it's about taking institutional responsibility, which is a very different thing from the US who would have bought things on the secondary or tertiary market. And so they're dealing with something that, it, I think it took some time for American museums to understand that this is also a conversation they have to have. But of course you have a very different situation in continental Europe. And I think part, or probably the biggest challenge is, and the biggest, plus in museums who deal with this well is that they, A, they do proactive research and B, they learn to communicate the problems and the challenges and, and, and coming to terms with the whole issue, finding unambivalent language to talk about what happened, find, acknowledging what happened, acknowledging to claimants. And, um, and in that way, if it's done well, it's a possibility for reconciliation. It's a possibility of coming, coming to the table together. If it's done badly, it's terrible. <laughs> I think it's the main point you mentioned. If I talk the museum I'm part-time working for, the Dresden State Art Collections, way there, between 19... 39 and 1945, one of the central points of uh, art robbery, of, of art transfer. The directors of the picture gallery, Hermann uh, Posse and Hermann Voss and Hans Posse and Hermann Voss, were uh, commissioned by Hitler to collect his uh, this uh, Linz collection. That's part of the history of our institution. That's an integral part of the history of our institution. I can't expect from a museum in maybe Minneapolis or wherever not the, the same attitude as, as we have. I think uh, we have a much higher moral obligation to, to do provenance research. If I could take that up too, and uh, um, I, I think you're right. I mean, with U.S. museums, it's not so much complicity, but I, I really don't know many museum directors and curators that like to give up their collection. So, you know, people worry about that, and they worry about a slippery slope. And so I think you have, one, the underfunding and the lack of funding for provenance research, lack of dedicated staff to do the work, you throw up a lot of obstacles, not because you're morally bad, it's just you want to be sure. So your standards of evidence are using a preponderance of evidence, or do you need to be, you know, clear and convincing, or does it need to be without a doubt? So, you know, museums will play with the, the, the principles of uh, evidence uh, they need. They don't necessarily make it easy because there's a lack of staff throughout American museums to deal with provenance. 
so, uh, you know, that is, that is there. Now, uh, Carola, you asked me about donors. And so most of the issue really does come down to donors. You know, that is the secondary and tertiary markets by which these things come into collections. And there, a lot of museums and even public museums rely on a lot of pu uh, private support. There's no public museum in the United States that doesn't rely on private support. They all rely on private support as well, even though they may be publicly funded. And in that, do you want to tell your donor, you know, you gave me this vase, you gave me this decorative art item, you gave me this painting, and we have problems about it. And the donor says, well, I didn't have any problem about it. It came from my father. This came through a family. It was fairly purchased, you know, the, the whole thing. And then you're in a, in a, you can get into arguments with donors who give you millions of dollars about their moral failing. When you talk to a donor about their moral failing, it's not exactly a great pitch to get them to give you money. So, so the, the, the kind of calculus changes a bit. And we've seen that with donors to the Met. We've seen some of it with donors to the Smithsonian, Chicago Art Institute, and many others. So it is, it is an issue. It's a different kind of argument, though. It shifts the ground somewhat, but it, 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 it no less affects the ability, uh, you know, to really examine items and restitute them, uh, if in that case. And in the United States, uh, there's issues of uh, Nazi-era provenance, but there are a lot of others, from wars in Cambodia, from wars all over the world, wherever America was involved, <laughs> you can bet there's artwork and artifacts that have come into museums as a result. I, at this point, I think I'd like to open the discussion to, to the audience. Is there, are there any questions from the audience? I actually want to add something to what Richard just said, because as someone who works for many American museums and other museums, I actually think that very much I've never encountered an experience where someone, an institution doesn't want to restitute something that perhaps they don't legally own. The question is this layered, very complicated historical situation means that you look from a slightly different perspective. But I don't think I agree with you on that. I think most donors also find it complicated to suddenly learn that something that they owned was a looted piece. But that doesn't mean that they can't come around to see that there's something about the history to learn. For example, I just want to say that I was a young curator at the Art Institute of Chicago when the Degas case first began. I wasn't in that department, but we were all so bewildered by what all was going on. And, and I knew the Searle family from growing up, so I actually sort of lived this from a lot of ways. What was interesting was, a number of years later, fast forward, you had a big sale at Christie's of things that had been restituted, and I was the Midwest director of Christie's at that time, and we were the agents who, helped to place an amazing silver object that was in that sale back in the museum as a major purchase. And somehow, this irony of the original claim and then the later acquisition didn't seem to really occur to anyone until it was pointed out. <coughs> because the Goodman collection was a great collection from the beginning and remained a great collection and people were willing to acquire it even though they had been through a large lawsuit. So it was, I think, a wonderful example of how things changed in the beginning and the end. There's still in the middle there, lady with the red sweater. But I would have no fear for, uh, before dollars, uh, dollars, my English is very bad, because Simon Goodman wrote in his book about his first restitution, who, uh, which was a Degas, and we, which belonged to a very, very rich milliardaire who wasn't willing to do anything about it. But in the end, he, he, he gave it to you, and it worked. So I think even a donor can be 
not perhaps happy, but willing to give um, a picture which had formerly a Jewish owner to a museum first, to the grandson uh, and then to a museum. So, no fear before Donna's. Don, Don, Donna's. Sorry, my English is bad. Well, well the reality is that Donna was made aware of the fact that to fight the claim in court would have cost more than the heat spent on the painting. And so he was a pragmatic man. And instead, what we did, instead of going to court, because we would have had trouble paying our legal fees, we decided to split the painting. And uh, the Art Institute paid my family for our half. And the ultra-rich donor got a nice tax write-off. Um, so it, it, it was called a Solomonic solution at the time. Uh, and it paved the way for, I mean, we were used as an example when they established the Washington principles and so on. But we, we still had to fight for several years to get to that point. So it, it wasn't, a, wasn't a ride in the park. Thanks. Thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, Mr. Goodman, we had the chance to talk already yesterday, but one point strike me quite a lot now. We made quite a uh, distinction between people who, uh, who uh, refer to uh, moral and people who refer to law. And I wonder at that point, and also that's a point I would like to, to, to ask Mr. Patzinger, is um, we, oh, you also made this, this distinction between uh, the problem with private collectors and uh, museums if it comes to restitutions. In fact, each law should be based on moral. So that means, at the end, uh, if you're talking about moral, it should be the same group as the law should be. Um, and saying that, we need, in fact, in a country like Germany, for example, a discussion on how important it is really to create now a restitution law. And as far as I know, there is already, there exists a draft of a restitution law. It, it was uh, drafted after the Gullet case. But if it comes to find a solution here, and that's a different, uh, the American system works differently, but if it's in Germany, we have to, to deal with this time barred claims. And so we have to come around this. And that means also that if we change the law here, to maybe to base it then on the moral understanding of our society nowadays, uh, the, the German state is also obliged to, to compensate the owner of a, the proprietor of a, artwork of today and so we have to find a solution in that way and I wonder whether this kind of discussion exists now and I also refer now to Mr. Lupfer uh, within the government of, in the, of Germany or whether there's a real uh, will to change the civil law on that point to find a solution to combine moral and, and law which I think is important for private people. As, as you mentioned me, I, I will answer and then um, Mr. Lupfer also can. I mean, I said that this with the law restitution law has pros and contras. Um, moral is good, trust is good, but to have a, a security is better. Um, but of course, it, what you said, uh, if we have a law and then a claimant wants his things back, if in Germany he goes to court, I mean, people have to think if they can afford that. In the US it's easier because each part is financing his part. In Germany it's, it's dif different. If, if you are losing a case at the courts, this yes, but nevertheless, it, it depends on the case, let's say. So it has pro and contras, but uh, my feeling is that, that for the moment this is not really intensively discussed within the government. I don't know what is your experience. Just the same. I don't expect this for the next years. I, I think there's no tendency in this, in this direction. And one point is the, the most famous case was Gurlitt. And Gurlitt uh, very soon said, okay, he, meanwhile he lived still, he was still alive, he said he agrees to Washington principles, provenance research. So I think the pressure would be stronger if we have many cases of private collections which became public that they do not want to restitute. 
then I think the public opinion could change and this could force the politicians really to make something, to act in a way. But meanwhile, this is not happening. I, I, I see it difficult. This has to be solved. Yeah. Um, I just have a... Oh, you were first. Thank you so much. Um, I think you're all extraordinary. Especially you, Simon. <laughs> um, but... Uh, He's a pain in me? No. <laughs> but um, now, Christie's and Sotheby's, as, as Simon mentioned, have restitution departments. Now the uh, Institute of Chicago has a provenance department. You know, these didn't exist before. I'm just curious, when a private seller goes to Christie's or Sotheby's, that painting is going to be researched. They're going to check with the art loss register. I was just wondering if you see any way for other auction houses to be encouraged to do the same so that there isn't this continual uh, a continuation of looted art being sold by the next generation and the generation after. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not only Christie's and South Peace. There are some others, uh, Doroteum, for example, they do provenance research. But if we come to the small auction houses and dealers, that's the, the, the difficulty. Uh, we, we come to this point where we have, they say we have no, no, no means, not the possibility to make intense provenance research. But about this, that each art dealer should make provenance re research. Uh, we are from the Deutsche Zentrum Kulturgutverluste with the unions of, of art dealers and so on. That's a, a hard business. That's, that's not, uh, not easy, but we try to convince them to, ac to accept this. I think there is a, a I can't say uh, not so much about this, the new uh, das, das, uh, neue fällt mir gerade an. Ja, das neue Kulturgutschutz art uh, protection. protection law plays uh, a, a certain role. The art dealers are very angry about this. They say it, it brings us in a very difficult situation. We can't do this res research. I think it's, it's a process. Just now we see that art de a lot of art dealers, not all, not all, I have to, I have to say, uh, don't, uh, don't want to, uh, to come near to, to this thing, they say we are very, a very discreet a, a business, we have to keep our secrets, we have to keep the secrets of our cl clients, we hear very often. That's a process, I think it we will develop something in the next years, but it's like with private collections, it's, it's rather difficult. I just want to say something, because um, I'm a reference librarian and archivist, so the phone calls come to me. Uh, there's a lot of very, there's like Christie's and the major dealers and then there's the mid-level auction houses and dealers. And then there's the local auction houses that sell off your grandmother's furniture for you. And I had a case at, with a local auction house in the DC area where they got, were given something as part of an estate to auction off and there was something on the back that kind of rang their bell and you know, it's like, this is an issue, so they called me. Um, and I did some quick research and it was a artist who had been looted repeatedly from private collections for German museums. And I'm like, okay, you're right, you might have an issue, here's who you need to talk to. But it's those really small dealers that you have to, it's like the Arkansas bric a -brac dealers who, um, you know, it's that level of research and that's actually something I was thinking of that maybe the museum community can say, okay, you're the grandma auction furniture people, but if you come with something, here's where you go. And I don't think they have that. You have 
Yeah, I, I mean, I've been invited, I think Gloria has been invited to different uh, art dealers association and smaller, smaller fairs all the time. And in fact, what's really exciting is that um, all the, the education that's being done here in Germany in terms of offering courses in conjunction with art history provenance research. And so a lot of workshops, but even to professionals who are in the, who are in the thing. <laughs> the je yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, <clears throat> okay. Um, I, I just want to highlight a point that Sophie Lilly brought up in a response to Megan Lewis and Caroline Lange. And that is what you may call power relations. You talked about the individual versus the institution. This was Simon's story, basically. Individual versus institution. So those, you can also call them asymmetrical power relations. And this is something I think in addition to all the other layers of let's say, accordance that could be reached on looking back at the evolution of provenance research is something that is not perhaps always reflected in the adequate way or reflected um, enough because it is a difference if you do this as an individual or as an institution. And I am saying that as an institutional person and as an individual researcher on my, in the same. So it is really complicated, but I think looking at those, let's say, who is able to do something and who is not and who is dependent on someone else, this is a very important level for the discussion. That was just my impression. Coming to the auction house, sorry, by coincidence I own an auction house and um, also I'm the president of the Association of German Fine Art Auctioneers. And um, the point is what we can do, if we, the Christian Sotheby's, they have departments working on that. What we do, is also, I, I have, I think now for five years, somebody also do, only doing provenance researches. And so, and what we heavily as a smaller auction house depend on are good research instruments and one of them is the lost art uh, uh, register and the other one art loss in London. And what we need is also uh, for our for, uh, of very big important, a lot, utmost importance of ours are that these instruments are working well. And so, and we heavily depend on the quality of the information in these databases. And so, because a small auction house cannot afford a large department, at the end, it's a business case. So I have a company, I have to earn money, and if we, I can't spend 1,000 uh, euros on research for a piece which has a value of 500 euros. And I only get, let's say, 200 euros of fees for, for, my, for, the, for the deal. So that we need another system, and we have, so therefore the lost art is very important for us. The the problem is that the information of the lost art is sometimes a little bit vague, to be honest. And so, and I think uh, a good thing would be if the lost art register would uh, spend more money, or if you get more money from the government to uh, to do a, uh, to uh, a support or to get a good support to really get good information and to make good uh, examination research on the quality of the, of the, information, of the information you uh, you give to us. That's more uh, a demand, to be honest. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, I think I'd like to wind up the discussion. I'd like to thank all of the panelists who came and talked to us. I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for joining in, for listening, and um, I would like to thank the NSD Dokumentationszentrum for hosting us this evening, and now I would like to extend an invitation to all of you to come back to the ZE with us. There will be some drinks, there are also some showcases with some little exhibitions, and then we can perhaps continue the discussion there. Thank you.